To many of us, nighttime driving is a pure pleasure. Everything seems more leisurely. Less traffic, less noise, fewer distractions. It's almost relaxing. But then a work zone, and what had been a pleasure often becomes a confusing ordeal, dramatically increasing a motorist's chances of being involved in an accident. Road work zones are inherently dangerous, even under the best conditions. They're often unexpected. They're full of distractions. They disrupt the routine of driving. But at nightfall, the inherent dangers increase, turning what was perhaps a mere annoyance in the daylight hours into a scene from a driver's worst nightmare. And with more and more road construction and maintenance being performed at night, it's not only the driver who's at risk, the highway worker who is often too preoccupied with the task at hand to keep a safety eye on traffic is much more vulnerable at night than in the daytime. In this program, we'll examine some of the factors that make road work areas more hazardous at night than they are in the daytime. We'll also demonstrate how the use of some simple, cost-effective devices can enhance the safety level in work zones by meeting the special needs of nighttime traffic control. As you know, the basic strategy for designing all types of traffic control is described in the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices for Streets and Highways. And in recognition of the fact that road work areas present unusual hazards for all road users, part six of the manual is devoted to outlining standards specifically concerned with traffic control through work zones. But when establishing a traffic control plan for a road work area, the traffic control designer must keep in mind that the standards found in the manual are based on normal conditions and the illustrations provided reflect typical applications regarding the use and the placement of various types of traffic control devices. Terms such as normal and typical imply that the standards presented in the manual cannot possibly take into account every roadwork situation, nor do they intend to. The standards leave a good deal of room for individual judgment on the part of the traffic control designer. For one thing, the standards are based on minimums, what is needed to get by, and they are intended to be supplemented as necessary according to the conditions found in the field. The standards are also based on daytime operations when visibility is good, on normal traffic loads moving at design speeds. And the driver? Well, the standards assume an average driver, one who is alert, cautious, in fair physical condition, and has 15 years of driving experience. The problem is that the real world seldom conforms to the standards. There are very few curves exactly like this one. Much of our driving is done at night or in bad weather. Traffic is often heavier and faster than normal. And for all practical purposes, the average driver doesn't really exist. So under average conditions, the standards found in the manual may provide adequate safety. But with each adjustment away from the average, the safety level drops at night, in bad weather, with a driver who is in less than top physical condition. The once adequate controls may become inadequate and the level of safety is decreased. Let's take a look at a few of the factors that move a work zone at night out of the realm of the average. Studies have shown that most drivers at night use their low beam headlights almost exclusively. And under normal conditions, low beams provide enough sight distance for adequate reaction time. But low beams tend to concentrate the light to the right hand side of the road. And in a work zone, traffic control devices on the left side may get only 60% of the light that right side devices receive. Less light, less visibility. For example, Jersey barriers on the left side of the road may seem like black holes. They virtually disappear because their surfaces absorb light. 
A U.S. DOT study has shown that 75% of all barrier-related fatalities in work zones occur at night. Rain, snow, and fog have a tremendous effect on nighttime safety. Much of the strength of your headlights is dissipated on its way toward the reflective sheeting on a traffic control device, and an equal amount is dissipated on its way back to your eyes. Dust from road construction is another problem. Reflective traffic control devices can lose more than 50% of their brightness to road dirt alone. And of course, driver characteristics have to be considered. Younger drivers with less experience can be easily distracted by the unfamiliar surroundings of a work area. And older drivers with slower reflexes will need more time to react to unexpected changes in the road ahead. Of course, age also affects vision, especially at night. According to a study done in Michigan, people need twice as much light to see the same object with the same clarity every 13 years after the age of 20. Here's the effect. At 20 years of age, at 33, at 46, and at 59. As you can see, Designing traffic control for the average driver may leave many others in the dark. The dangers of alcohol and drug use on our highways have been well documented, but two more points must be made. First, more people are under the influence of alcohol at night than in the daytime. And second, when we say drugs, we're not talking only about illegal drugs. Common medicines can also cause trouble. Any substance that makes you less than fully alert will affect your ability to see a hazard, recognize it, and react to it. Familiarity with the area is another factor. Drivers who don't know the area are at a disadvantage even under the best conditions. Confusion is easy to understand, but it's not easy to overcome. Especially in roadway work areas, where many things compete for a driver's attention. Oddly enough, drivers who are familiar with the area can be at a disadvantage as well. People talk about driving on automatic pilot. They don't really pay attention to the road. They're so familiar with the route and all the signs, curves, and road conditions that they simply don't concentrate on the job of driving. And then something new is introduced. That something new could be a work zone. A work zone that wasn't there yesterday. Or a work zone at night or in bad weather. With a driver who needs twice as much light as a 20-year-old. Or a driver under the influence. A work zone, already a dangerous place, becomes more hazardous with each step beyond the average conditions described in the manual. The two factors that most greatly affect nighttime safety in roadway work areas are vision and visibility. At first glance, they look like synonyms, but there is a difference. Vision is internal to the driver. It's the quality of the driver's eyesight, and there are a number of factors that affect it. The driver's age, for example. The use of corrective lenses. The ambient light available. The use of low beams versus high beams. The condition of the driver's headlights. 70% of all vehicles out there right now have misaligned headlights. And dirty headlights can cut down the light by 50% or more. Even the tinted glass and the angle of the windshield can reduce light by more than 30%. Not to mention the effects a dirty windshield can have on a driver's vision. Then, of course, there's rain, snow, fog, and other adverse weather conditions. Visibility, on the other hand, is external to the driver. And the visibility of traffic control devices at night depends primarily on three factors. The size of the object, its brightness, and its position in relation to the position of the driver. There's an obvious connection between the size of an object and how well it can be seen. Call it target value or visibility or whatever. The larger the object, the more attention it'll receive. At night, 
the brightness of a device is largely determined by how well it emits its own light or how well it reflects light, especially the light coming from approaching vehicles. The position of a device is directly related to its brightness. In order to be most effective, all reflective devices have to be positioned such that as much light as possible is reflected straight back to the driver. Positioning also means taking care to see that the driver's line of sight isn't blocked. A costly, highly reflective sign is useless if it's not easily visible to oncoming traffic. Now, highway people have no control in terms of improving nighttime vision. So their efforts must be aimed at improving and enhancing nighttime visibility. And there's a lot that can be done in that area. Start with an inspection of the work site beforehand. Anticipate visibility problems. Will there be any sight obstructions or conflicting signs? Where will the headlights go? Consider the simple but effective addition of flags and warning lights to the standard devices available. They're both attention getters. Flags for the daytime and warning lights at night. And where additional emphasis is called for, type B high intensity lights may be used. The real criteria for any device is simple. Can you see it? Does it command attention? When the purpose is to guide as well as to warn drivers, Type C steady burning lights outline the safe travel path more clearly than any other device available. The effects that lights have on improved visibility is evident. Judge for yourself. A series of barricades without lights and a series with lights. A jersey barrier without lights or reflectors and a barrier clearly outlined with lights. Drums without lights and drums with lights. In every case, the simple addition of lights to a standard traffic control device significantly improves its visibility at night. Even when the reflective sheeting on a device is covered or barely visible, warning lights and flags attached to the device still send a clear message, danger. Warning lights also denote hazards for pedestrians and bicyclists who must rely on external lighting, not reflected light to see potential hazards. Clearly, warning lights can increase the sight distance available for all road users. But warning lights and flags are by no means the only tools available for improving work zone traffic control. Aero panels, for example, have proven themselves in all sorts of situations. Their high intensity lights command attention and their specific, emphatic instructions are clearly understood almost immediately. Highly useful both in daylight hours and at night, when extra emphasis and extra guidance may well mean life or death. Other devices include temporary marking tape and raised pavement markers. They're easy to install when work begins and to remove when the work is finished. In the meantime, their bright, reflective surfaces delineate the safe travel path through a work zone both night and day. Even that old standby, the traffic cone, can provide good nighttime visibility when its surface is reflectorized. And for improved worker safety, orange safety vests with reflectorized striping should be worn by everyone at the job site. The fact that many of the workers seen throughout this program were not wearing safety vests is proof that this simple precaution is too often ignored. Again, there's no way for the traffic engineer to improve nighttime vision. But visibility? Yes. And in most cases, improvements in nighttime visibility can be made easily and inexpensively. Using better reflective sheeting on signs, using larger signs, adding flags, adding lights, using temporary pavement markings and raised pavement markers, using channelizing devices with warning lights, using aero panels, and insisting that all members of the work crew are protected with reflectorized safety clothing. Nighttime visibility can be improved and safety follows visibility. In any case, with any traffic control device,
the whole effort is wasted without constant monitoring and maintenance. There is no such thing as a maintenance-free traffic control device. Signs, lights, drums, barricades, and vertical panels need to be cleaned periodically. It has to be part of the plan. High-grade reflective sheeting is effective only as long as the surface isn't reduced by road film. Rechecking the positioning of all devices is equally critical. Unless the reflective sheeting on the device can throw light right back to the driver, its value is lessened, and sight obstructions can defeat the best devices anytime, but especially at night. Maintenance of lights is critical. If lights are part of the overall plan, they're an integral part of the plan and must be maintained. Pavement markings and markers, once in place, are effective only as long as they're properly maintained. Cleaning and restriping should be done on time as scheduled. Again, in some cases, the minimum standards of work zone traffic control are adequate, but each situation must be examined carefully. In a tort liability case, providing the public with the minimum standards may not always be an adequate defense. Work zones can and should provide the highest level of nighttime traffic control service possible, even matching or surpassing the existing roadway's level of service. That's our basic obligation to everyone on the road, to make a dangerous area less of a hazard. It means taking into account all the factors that make a work zone potentially more hazardous in the nighttime than it is in the daytime. It means going beyond the standards when necessary, improving them to meet the special needs of nighttime traffic control. It means using state-of-the-art devices to provide the highest levels of guidance and safety for all road users at all times. It means, quite simply, designing and maintaining work zone traffic control as if someone's life depended on it. That's adequate traffic control, meeting the needs of the real world.